Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr. starred in the 1996 movie called Jerry Maguire. Now, Tom Cruise plays the role of a sports agent with only one client. Cuba Gooding Jr. plays the part of a gridiron footballer who made the line, show me the money, famous. Now in our passage today, the religious leaders asked Jesus a trick question about paying taxes, and he responded by saying, show me the money. Now we're in a section of Matthew where Jesus is being grilled by the Jewish mafia. The purpose of the question asked was to cause Jesus to incriminate himself. But Jesus gives wise answers to foolish questions. Sometimes questions can be absurd, even stupid. And there's a collection of funny questions lawyers have actually asked people who are under oath. And here are a few taken from court, actual court records. Now, doctor, isn't it true that when a person dies in their sleep, they only find out about it the next morning? Secondly, were you present when your picture was taken? Was it you or your younger brother that was killed in the war? The youngest brother, the 20-year-old, how old is he? Now, I could go on and on and on because there's an endless list of these ridiculous questions. But let's have a look at the question that the Jewish Mafia asked Jesus. I'm going to read from uh, Matthew 22, 15, verse 22, uh, to verse 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Now, what is wrong with this picture? The Pharisees and the Herodians were joining forces against Jesus. These two groups were on opposite extremes of the Jewish culture, the Herodians were a secular group who supported the Romans, and the Pharisees were a spiritual group who hated the Romans. Be like the, the EFF and the Freedom Front gaining force, joining forces. But the Pharisees and the Herodians want, both wanted to get rid of Jesus. They demonstrated the old saying, My enemy's enemy is my friend. Now, did you notice that the Jewish leaders approached Jesus under the cloak of flattery? They butted him up by saying that he was a man of integrity and a great teacher. Flattery isn't the same thing as true admiration. Flattery is patting somebody on the back to find the soft spot to, to, where to insert the, the dagger. Flattery is just gossip in reverse. Gossip is saying something bad behind a person's back that you would never say to his face. And flattery is saying something good to a person's face that you would never say behind his back. Flattery is mouth-to-mouth -mouth manipulation. Now, after softening Jesus up with a few short jabs of flattery, they slipped in the knockout question. Is it right to pay tax to Caesar? As soon as the question was asked, you could almost hear the Jewish leaders giggling with glee because they were certain Jesus would be trapped with no room for escape. If he said yes, all the people who expected the Messiah to liberate them from Romans would desert him. On the other hand, if he said no, the Romans would have arrested him on the spot for treason. Instead, Jesus, who didn't even possess a coin, said to them, show me the money. As he held up the Roman denarius, he asked his own question, whose image and description is this? The coin had the image of Tiberius Caesar stamped on it. And the inscription on the flip side of the coin says in Latin, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus, high priest. Just as a matter of interest, the coin itself was blasphemous to a good Jew because it bore a graven image which violated the second commandment. 
Then Jesus gave his wise answer to this foolish question. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. That statement qualifies as a parable because Jesus takes one truth that you need to pay the government what is due and beside it he lays down a parallel truth. Give to God what is God's. This brilliant reply teaches us three things. Firstly, as a follower of Jesus, we hold dual citizenships. Some people hold two or more passports because they are citizens of two or more countries. In this passage of scripture, Jesus reminds us that we hold dual citizenships. He said, to, to, he said give to Caesar what is Caesar's. By that statement, he indicated that all of us live in an earthly government. He also said, give to God what is God's. In addition to our relationship with an earthly government, we must also consider our relationship with God. So if you're a Christian, you live in relationship with Caesar, the government, and with God. It's like holding two passports. The Apostle Paul pointed this out in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3 verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we doing down here on earth? We are like ambassadors, again, which Paul points out in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. Now, each country has ambassadors in most foreign countries, and it's their job to represent their home country in the foreign one. I think a lot of them, even though living somewhere else, don't really feel at home in this strange land. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis which describes this sense of being homesick for, from heaven. He wrote, If I discover within myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. So let's talk about this dual citizenship. If you're a South African citizen, you have a responsibility to your government as well as a responsibility to God. Now this brings me to the second lesson. The Bible teaches us that we must honor and obey the authorities who govern me. The King James Version says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The best translation is, give it back. Because Rome minted and distributed the coins, it was only proper to give them back to Rome. Now here's the principle. As South Africans, we should submit to the authority of our government. Romans 13 verse 1 and verse 6 says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Now, we may not like our government in South Africa, but the Bible says that God establishes governments. Remember who was the authority when Paul wrote this? The vicious, brutal, Christian-hating Nero was emperor at the time. All power of every government comes from God. Now, do you remember when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate on the day that he was crucified? Pilate asked Jesus all kinds of questions. And Jesus just sat there quietly without giving any answers. As the scripture prophesied, he was like a, lion, a lamb, silent before the shearers. Finally, in exasperation, Pilate says, Do you realize I have the power to free you or to crucify you? Now, I just love the answer that Jesus gives. And I believe that Jesus looked at Pilate with eyes like a blazing, blazing fire and said in a voice cool enough to freeze hell, he said, you would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. That's where the government gets its power. The problem with this passage of scripture is that we often focus so much on what Jesus said about rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's, that we miss the impact of the main thing that Jesus was teaching us when he said, and give to God what is God's. The third lesson we learn is that we can freely choose to honor and obey the God who made us. Jesus wasn't mainly talking about our relationship with our government. He was talking about our relationship with our Creator. We give back to God, which is God's. What is God's? If we don't pay our taxes or obey the laws of the land, we can be arrested. We have very little choice in the matter. 
But what do we have a choice on offering God what is his? When people looked at a Roman coin, they saw an image of Caesar because his image was stamped on it. Where do we find God's image? To answer that question, we need to go all the way back to when God created the world. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. So what do we owe God? We owe him whatever has his image stamped on it. That's us. We are to give him our lives. When God created us in his image, doesn't mean that we look like God. It means that God is a triunity, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are also created in a triunity, body, soul, and spirit. None of us may look very godly, but we are all made in his image. Because his image is stamped on us, we are to give him something greater than our money. We must give him ourselves. Now, we don't have to give the government all our money, but sometimes it feels like they, it's all they want. But when it comes to giving ourselves to God, there is only one amount that is accepted, and that is all. With God, it's all or nothing. He doesn't want you to give him one or two hours a week for worship. He wants you to give him his, your allegiance 168 hours a week. That's every day. He doesn't want you to give him your religious life. He wants you to give him your family life, your work life, your leisure life. In other words, your all. There's an ancient fable about a farmer who was taking a sack of corn to sell in town. On the way there, he saw the king ride by in his golden chariot. The farmer fell to his knees to bow before the king. He said, Your Majesty, I'm your humble servant. What can I give you to honor you? The king said, Will you give me all your corn? The farmer said, I'm sorry, sire, I cannot do that. I need to sell it in town to get money to feed my family. However, I will give you five kernels of corn. The king said, as you wish, I will accept the five kernels as a gift from you. He directed a servant to remove five kernels from the farmer's sack. Now, when the farmer got into town, he opened his sack of corn and discovered that the king's servant had replaced the five kernels of corn with five small nuggets of gold. When he saw the gold, the farmer wept and said, If I had only given more to the king, I would have received so much more. He was ashamed that he had not honored the king's request to give him all he had. In conclusion, there is so much dissatisfaction in our culture today. People have bought into the idea that wealth brings happiness and contentment. There was a study done in America with a thousand millionaires and the study showed that 46% of them felt that they weren't wealthy enough and were worried about their financial future. Now, the average wealth of these people was a net income of about four, three and a half million dollars. The survey asked what number they would like to attain before they felt wealthy. And the average answer was seven and a half million dollars. The biblical writer of Ecclesiastes realized this centuries ago. He wrote in chapter 5 verse 10, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is net, never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Now you may not be a dissatisfied millionaire. You may not be a, a dissatisfied high school dropout with no job. Dissatisfaction is no respecter of persons. But when I look at the Bible, I find an antidote for this dis dissatisfaction. It's a short seven word formula found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. And it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness just means living for God. Godliness happens when you give to God what is God's, which is your life. And when you do that, you can find true contentment. I heard about a, a cello player who was sitting on the pavement playing for tips and he was only playing one note and he played that same note over and over and over again. And a passerby asked him, why don't you play any other notes? He smiled and said, everyone is looking for the right note and I found it. 
All around us, people are searching for this right note. They're searching for satisfaction. But when you give your life to God, you've found it. Amen.